It's my great pleasure to introduce Anshul Kundaye from Stanford University. Anshul is a star in the field of machine learning and computational biology. He did his PhD at Columbia University, was a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford and a research scientist at MIT before then joining Stanford as an assistant professor of genetics and computer science. His particular focus is machine learning for regulatory genomics. He has won a number of uh, major awards, the Hugo Chen Award of Excellence from the Human Genome Organization, the NIH Director's New I In Innovator Award, the Alfred Sloan Foundation Research Fellowship, and he is also an advisor on the NIH Director's um, Advisory Committee for Artificial Intelligence in Biomedical Research. And uh, if you remember Ewan Bernie's talk from yesterday, then you remember that he also said Anshul is one of the persons who can do very interesting and clever stuff with deep learning and computational biology. And um, I think we'll learn more about this now. So we are happy to have you here. And the floor is yours, Anshul. And I would like to point out he's on the West Coast, so he got up uh, before <laughs> in the morning to deliver this talk, which we all appreciate very much. So please. We look Thanks, Karsten. Talk. Thank you. So um, thank you for the kind introduction, Karsten. And uh, thank you all for, the, for being here today. Um, I wish I could be there in person but I guess this is better than nothing. Uh, so uh, today I'm gonna to talk to you about um, some recent advances uh, that we have made in applying deep learning approaches uh, to model uh, various kinds of regulatory genomics data uh, with the goal of trying to discover cis regulatory syntax. Okay, and this, um, this work is actually in a preprint, which is right here. It has a similar uh, title. If you just Google for it, you'll probably find it. Um, and before I begin, I just want to start with some acknowledgements. So uh, this was an incredible collaboration. Um, Ziga Abjek, who was a graduate student at Technical University of Munich uh, in Julian Garnier's lab. Uh, he visited my lab about two years ago over the summer, just for three months. And uh, I had this idea at the time, and my students didn't, were all inundated with projects and uh, I just asked Ziga to give it a try. And uh, he is just a fantastic scientist. He took this and took it to heights that we could never imagine. Um, Avanti in my lab has been developing, um, she just graduated. She's in fact leaving the lab in five days. Um, she's been tremendous and built a whole slew of very interesting methods for interpreting neural networks, um, general approaches, not just for genomics. Uh, Melanie is in Julia Zeitlinger's lab. So this is a very great collaboration with Julia, uh, who's a fantastic biologist, um, an expert on the cis regulatory code. She's also done uh, really great assay development and we'll use one of her assays in today's, uh, today's talk. Uh, Melanie is in Julia's lab and Amar is a, uh, was a new graduate student in my lab who helped with the project as well. So this was a really great collaborative effort um, from three labs effectively. Um, so I'll talk to you today about their work. So let's talk about the main goal of the project. Um, as you know, you can now perform uh, genome-wide high throughput experiments that can profile chromatin accessibility, for example, a TAC-seq or DNA-seq experiments, or you can perform chip-seq experiments that profile hundreds of transcription factors in many different cell lines and tissues. And <clears throat> these data sets are allowing us to get um, really detailed maps of regulatory elements in the genome in different cell types, tissues, and contexts. Um, the key question remains as to how uh, proteins, uh, regulatory proteins like transcription factors, are able to recognize uh, these specific elements in specific cell types, giving rise to dynamic binding and regulatory landscapes. And as you know, um, these transcription factors recognize uh, short DNA sequence motifs, uh, in the genome and they bind combinatorially. Um, traditionally work has largely focused on motif discovery. That is how individual transcription factors bind uh, specific motifs. Uh, what we were interested in moving uh, one step further and trying to discover um, rules of motif syntax. And by that we mean um, composition of regulatory elements, um, the rules of arrangement of these motifs, 
um, preferred spacings, orientations, and effectively how these rules have quantitative effects on transcription factor binding. By that, I mean, you know, cooperative effects, additive effects, what's the nature of the actual effects of these combinations of motifs coming together. So we want to build quantitative models that can really make strong predictions and derive insights about syntax. That's really what I'll focus on today. So um, just to go over how we translate this into a machine learning task, if you're given a transcription factor chip seek data set or a tax seek data set, so DNA seek data set, effectively what you're getting is a readout across the whole genome, right? So let's say you take the human genome, it's 3 billion bases. So every base is associated with a corresponding um, estimate of binding, which could be continuous. So it could be counts of reads, it could be some kind of normalized enrichment of reads, or it could be binary. So for example, bound, unbound, or active, inactive, based on some peak calling strategy. And so what you end up with is effectively, um, if you bin the genome um, into, let's say, 1,000 base pair bins, then you have millions of sequences of, of length 1,000 base pairs, a library of sequences associated with corresponding labels, right? And again, these labels could be binary or continuous. And so if you look at this kind of a data set, you've got a large collection of input sequences as I, and your goal is to map them to some scalar label Yi. Um, you can learn some prediction function, so it fits very nicely into a classification or regression supervised machine learning task, right? And there's been tons of work in this space over many years to solve this problem, uh, ranging from you know, linear models to probabilistic you know, uh, approaches to support vector machines, and more recently, neural networks. <clears throat> so how do actually neural networks work? I'll give a quick 101 um, with a specific example. So in this case, we have millions of DNA sequences, or we want to take any DNA sequence, as shown here at the bottom, and map it to, uh, let's say, a binary value, uh, answering the question, is this sequence bound by a particular TF or not? So what we can do is take the sequence and first start by representing it with uh, what's called a one-hot encoding, which is simply a matrix of four rows and L columns with a one or a zero corresponding to which nucleotide is present at each position, okay? <clears throat> and the basic unit of a neural network is uh, an artificial neuron. Uh, you can think of it as a simple pattern detector. It takes in a bunch of inputs, in this case, five nucleotides, and tries to detect some pattern in it. So what is a neuron? Well, an artificial neuron is just a simple prediction function that takes in a bunch of inputs and produces some output, okay? In this case, this neuron takes 20 inputs, uh, five positions by four bases, right? 20 binary values. And the simplest kind of um, neuron you can think of, of, of prediction function is a linear function. So it just takes these inputs and performs a linear combination to produce an output. Z. And uh, since we have 20 inputs, uh, our neuron would have to have 20 weights, right? 20 parameters, in, uh, excluding the bias. Okay. Um, we can arrange these 20 parameters in the same configuration as the input. So that would be a matrix of size 4 by 5, ACGD, each, each row, in five uh, positions. And let's assume we knew the weights, the values of these weights, okay? Some positive, negative values. Uh, this neuron's parameters would look basically like a matrix, right? If you visualize this matrix, you notice that it effectively looks like a motif, right? So the key insight here is that an artificial neuron operating on a DNA sequence, uh, the weights of those neurons uh, effectively encode motif-like pattern detectors, okay? So there's a nice parallel between uh, classical, you know, sequence motifs that we've been using for years and the weights matrices encoded by artificial neurons in neural networks. If you want to score the sequence with this neuron, what we do is uh, take these weights, multiply them by the inputs and add them up, right? So a simple um, element-wise multiplication uh, followed by a sum. So in this particular case, we get a Z uh, a score of 11.6, that's a linear score. 
And what you typically do is take these uh, linear outputs from the neuron and pass it through some nonlinear function H. Uh, the nonlinear functions typically used uh, either one particular class of functions is a logistic, which basically takes the Z and squashes it into a zero one range, right? So this is quite nice if you want to convert the outputs into probabilities. Uh, very similar logistic regression, basically. The other commonly used nonlinear function is the ReLU, rectified linear unit, which just takes the output 11.6. And if it's less than zero, it thresholds it to zero. So think of it as a thresholding function, right? So in this case, the Y will, would be 11.6. Now this is how a single artificial neuron acts on the sequence at particular position in the sequence. But if our goal is to take a DNA sequence input, any DNA sequence input and classify whether it's bound or not by a TF, obviously we need more than one pattern detector, right? Because the, the sequence could have many, many different motifs and many different patterns. So instead of having one neuron, which captures one type of pattern, imagine having a bank of neurons, in this case, let's say hundreds of neurons, uh, with the goal that each neuron will try to learn or, or encode a different pattern, a different motif like pattern. And then if you're given a motif, what do you typically do? You take the motif, and then you scan the sequence, right? To look for high scoring matches. You can do exactly that operation by taking this bank of neurons. In this case, I've shown you three, but imagine you've got 100 and you just replicate them one base at a time, uh, such that uh, all the neurons shown in the same color have the same weights. So what's effectively happening is you're taking this neuron, you're scanning the sequence with it, right? And each window in the sequence is being scored according to how good of a match it is to the weights encoded by the neuron, the motif encoded by the neuron. And so basically you've got a new matrix of math scores of all of these patterns across the sequence. Now what you can do is you can stack more neurons on top of the first layer. And what these neurons are gonna do is take the patterns learned by the first layer and combine them or do linear combinations of those and create more complex patterns. And as you stack more and more layers, you can learn arbitrarily more complex patterns until the final layer is learning some very complex nonlinear representation of the DNA sequence. And then that final layer is basically going to go through a linear function or a logistic function to predict the output. So if your goal is to predict binary outputs, this is basically logistic regression on the final layer, right? So we induced a whole bunch of novel features directly from the DROS DNA sequence. And then the last layer is performing logistic regression or linear regression. So this kind of model has been uh, up, you know, applied quite often to DNA sequence since 2015, uh, starting with uh, the famous DeepBind paper. And all of these neurons have weights and biases. Um, and your goal is to learn these weights. That's the whole point of learning the model. So given millions of these sequence windows with their associated labels coming from the ChIP-seq experiment, you can now train this model. You can give it millions of training examples and an algorithm like uh, stochastic gradient descent with back propagation can effectively learn, optimize these weights to minimize some loss function, which compares the predicted outputs to the uh, actual observed outputs and tries to minimize the difference or some kind of loss function operating on those two, okay? So this has been quite successful. Um, I'll argue that uh, this approach is losing a lot of information. And the reason is as follows. If you take any of the classical experiments that are used to profile regulatory DNA, like ChIP-seq, ChIP-exo, or Nexus, DNA-seq, or TAC-seq, uh, in this current approach, you're taking a large chunk of sequence and you're assigning it a scalar label right? Either total counts or enrichment or binary scores. The problem with that is if you actually look at the data at base resolution, a single base resolution, you notice that actually the data sets, each of these assays produce beautiful uh, profiles um, around binding sites. So ChIP-seq, for example, produce these uh, stranded shifts in read coverage around binding sites. Chip Exo and Nexus will produce even higher resolution footprints. Again, these very specific mirrored images of uh, read pileups uh, right near the binding site. Uh, 
Uh, as you know, DNA seq and attack seq also produce footprints where proteins are bound. So the, you, at base resolution, you will see these footprints with you know read pileups on either side. And all of these structures of the reads, this fine scale structure actually has very interesting properties about how proteins bind DNA, right? The actual contacts. And so we don't want to lose this information by taking this entire region and just assigning some binary labor to it, right? Or continuous like a uh, count labor to it. <clears throat> so our goal was to model this data at base resolution. And this is what for example of some chip exo data, chip nexus data from Julia's lab. Um, Basically, ChipNexus is similar to ChipSeq, except it uses exonuclease, which digests the DNA all the way to the protein DNA contact. Uh, and so you get very high resolution footprints. And this is one locus in the genome where you can see um, binding of uh, four classic pluripotency transcription factors, OC4, SOX2, NANOG, and KLF. Uh, and you can see even at base resolution at a single um, enhancer, you can see beautiful uh, footprints, combinatorial footprints of the four transcription factors. So this is the data we're going to model today, specifically this system. But the approach I'm going to talk to you about is very gen general, can be applied to all kinds of regulated genomics data, not just chip exo. You can apply it to DNA seq, attack seq, chip seq, pro seq, and we've done a lot of this in the last few months. So here's the basic idea or the basic tweak. Uh, instead of predicting some scalar value, a goal is to actually now take a DNA sequence input and map it base by base to a corresponding profile, okay? And we directly model count profiles. So we just take the, we don't even have to necessarily do peak calling. We just take the chip seq data or the chip exo data. We map it to the genome and we count how many reads, five prime ends of reads that we get at each position on the plus and minus strand. So our goal is to predict the two strands in separately, because as you saw, there's interesting strand shift information that can potentially give you interesting insights into where the binding sites precisely are. So our goal is to take the sequence and map it to a profile. So think of it almost like analogous to like a text to speech converter, right? Except that we're not gonna use fancy architectures. We're still gonna to stick to regular convolutional neural networks like I presented before. Uh, but our model is fully convolutional. That means um, if, if you know something about CNNs, um, we're not using any pooling layers and so forth. It's fully convolutional. It's basically just these motif detectors stacking one on top of each other all the way up to the final layer. And we're going to try to map 1,000 base pair sequences to 1,000 base pair profiles across the entire genome. And um, our goal is to also simultaneously predict not just the plus and minus strand of uh, of one transcription factor, but you can multitask. That is, you can simultaneously predict the binding profiles for many, many TFs. So in this case, we will predict four transcription factors together. Okay. So they share the, basically, they share the parameters um, all the way up to the last layer. And in the last layer, they diverge into their respective models. Um, the way we do this is we try to model this data in two ways. So if you think about it, a profile has two properties. One is the shape of the signal, right? Think of it as the probability of observing reads at each position in the sequence. Uh, and the second aspect is the total number of reads in that region, right? So you can think of it almost like a multinomial distribution where you basically have um, a total number of reads that are being mapped to that thousand base pair sequence. And then you have to decide precisely how you distribute those n reads in that thousand base pair window across each position, right? With some probability at each position. So there's a multinomial distribution running over the sequence. Um, and you're trying to figure out how to uh, not only predict the total number of reads, which people typically used to do before, the scalar, but you also want to figure out precisely how those total number of reads are distributed across each position based on some multinomial distribution. So we designed a novel loss function to optimize the model, which couples these two outputs. So we simultaneously predict the total counts in the, in the, in the region using uh, a mean squared error for the log of the total counts. And then we designed a multinomial negative log likelihood function as a loss function for the profile prediction, which captures the probability of observing reads at each position. Okay, and these are conditioned on the sequence. <clears throat> 
Now, the other nice thing we introduced is uh, all of these assays have a lot of biases, right? As you know, enzyme biases and whatnot. And typically people correct for these biases uh, before they fit models. What we decided to do is have an automatic bias correction system where basically we add the bias, some measure of bias. It could be, for example, input DNA, or it could be a DNA's bias or whatever. In the, our case, we used a patch cap bias, bias track. We add that as an auxiliary input in the final layer of the model. And so the model automatically learns to regress out the bias and then fit the sequence to the residual. This all happens simultaneously. And lastly, the architecture of the model is just a fancier version of a convolutional neural network. We use something called dilated convolutions, which allow us to save parameters. And then we also use something called residual connections, which allow us to build pretty deep networks. Okay, so that's the model. And we train this across the whole genome. So the model does remarkably well at predictions. So what we do is we hold out some chromosomes and we train on some chromosomes and we do this in 10 fold cross validation. And this is the, uh, some two loci, two representative loci at base resolution. So the red, uh, this is one enhancer, and this is another enhancer. Uh, the top curves, uh, to, sorry, the top um, uh, plots in, in each color represent the observed profiles from the actual data. And the, um, the bottom tracks represent the predicted profiles from the model using sequence only. And these are held out chromosomes. So the sequence has never been seen in training. And you can see at base resolution, the models actually do quite remarkably well. They, are, they almost look like in some cases, indistinguishable uh, from the data. In other cases, they in fact denoise the data. Uh, if you think about it very carefully, you're predicting the expected value of a multinomial. And so actually it has the ability to correct dropout naturally. Uh, when you have sparse data at a, at a particular locus, the model actually imputes uh, the expected distribution, which is quite nice. Um, so that's at two loci. We want to know how we actually do across the whole genome. And so what we do is uh, we evaluate the performance of the model on both tasks. That is, how do we do on total counts and how do we do on the shape of the profile? Now for chip exo, what you really care about are the locations of these footprints, the precise footprints. And so what we can do is, even though we predict the profile at base resolution as a continuous count profile, uh, we can evaluate this in a slightly different way. We've used multiple metrics. I'm just showing you one of them. Uh, think of taking the observed profile and then marking each base as a positive or negative uh, sign. The positive sign re represent these spikes the sort of the flanks of the footprints, right? So wherever you see the spikes, you label those positions as positive, and then the rest of the sequence gets labeled negative. And this happens across all the peaks in the genome. And so now what you can do is you can take the predicted profile and basically evaluate it against a bunch of binary labels at each base. And you wanna, basically the model should have a high area under the precision recall curve, telling us that the predicted profiles uh, produce footprint locations that are exactly synchronous with the observed footprint locations, right? Now, the data is obviously noisy, and so we wanna allow for some wiggle room. So what we do is we allow the predicted positions, we smooth them over different bin sizes, ranging from one base pair, which would be exact matching, to 10 base pairs. So we allow for some smoothness. And we also need a reference as to how well we're doing and so we compare basically our performance, the model's performance, to the similarity between replicates. So if you use one replicate to predict another replicate, what would be the performance of the, of the so that what would be the concordance between the two replicates? And so the blue curve you see is the area under the precision recall curve of replicate experiments. And these are very high quality replicates. You can also like pool data and create sampling replicates, which are just pseudo replicates. And that gives you an even higher uh, upper bound. So this is about as, as well as you could do. Basically, this is the sort of the data quality or the noise in the data in some sense. And the yellow um, curve is showing, or the yellow points represent the model. Sorry, the yellow points represent the replicates. The blue points represent the data, the model. 
the green curve or the green points represent uh, what an average profile would do. If you just take all the peaks and you average a footprint and you use it to predict binding, that's what the green um, uh, points uh, look look like. And finally, the the black points represent a random profile. So I just, if I just shuffle the profiles and I try to predict um, the actual observed profile, what would it look like, right? So the black is the lower bound. Um, the yellow is kind of an upper bound. And the green is what you would do naively if you just averaged, if you didn't have a model that actually learned from sequence. So what you can see is on average for most of our TFs, we are almost as good or slightly better than the replicates. And the reason we're slightly better is because the model is uh, denoising the data and we are fitting the model uh, to the pooled replicates. So we pool the data and we fit it. So effectively we're able to learn on a higher signal to noise ratio data set and really maximize how much we can learn. So this is very cool because basically what we're seeing, at least in terms of profile shape and the locations of the footprints, uh, the model is able to predict from raw DNA sequence at base resolution uh, with a precision um, as high as replicate experiments, which is very encouraging. But what we also want to do is uh, look at the total counts of prediction, right? So you not only want to get the profiles correct, but you also want to get the total counts correct. Now in the total count prediction, what we observe is something quite different. And the replicates actually show very high concordance, 0 0.96, 0 0.82, 0 0.97. But the model does well, uh, certainly better than anything we've seen before, but it's still not very high. So this is just the correlation on the peak regions. Okay, so if you do genome-wide correlation, this is gonna look very high because you have most of your genome basically stuck at zero. Uh, so that gives you artificially high correlations. We're only looking at the signal regime of the data that's in peak regions. And you can see that we are actually getting pretty good correlation even across peaks, but it's not anywhere close to replicates. And uh, actually we think this is not an artifact of an inferior model. Uh, you should note that we're only using thousand base pairs of sequence in a region to predict binding at the region. And obviously there are many other things that are contributing to binding of a transcription factor. So for example, the chromatin state of the region has an influence. So for example, if the, if the DNA is repressed, then obviously protein would not bind there even if it has the right sequence. Um, similarly, long range interactions, distal interactions, we know have influence on local TF occupancy. Uh, for example, people have found distal QTLs, SNPs and other enhancers that can regulate quantitative changes in binding at some other enhancer. We are not modeling any of those aspects. So the conclusion we can make from the model is that uh, the local sequence is sufficient to exactly predict the shape or the footprinting profile of a transcription factor. But if you want to model the total counts, total occupancy at a site, you need more than the thousand base pairs, okay? And we leverage the difference between these two predictions when we are interpreting the model to figure out what's happening. All right, so that's the modeling piece for you. So um, we're very happy with our predictions, but are our predictions actually useful? The answer is no, because we already have the data, right? So what's the point? Well, our goal is not so much to make predictions of data we already observe, but is to now start taking the neural network, all the beautiful parameters it has learned that have allowed it to predict the profiles of unseen sequences with high accuracy and interpret those and see what they actually are learning. Okay, so we're gonna talk about model interpretation now. So now given this kind of a model, the first question we might ask is, if I'm given a particular enhancer in the genome and it has this beautiful binding profile for this transcription factor, what nucleotides in the DNA sequence are actually helping the model make this prediction, right? So uh, Avanti in my lab built this algorithm called DeepLift, which we published in 2017 at ICML. What it does, it can take the output of the model of any neural network and it can recursively decompose the contributions of individual neurons all the way down the network using a backpropagation scheme, which is very efficient. And what you end up with is a contribution score for every nucleotide, such that if you sum up these contribution scores, okay, it gives you the difference of the reference, uh, difference of the output prediction with respect to some reference input. So imagine a dinucleotide shuffled input, what output it would produce 
the contribution of each base is telling you like a decomposed version of the difference for, of the observed prediction or the measured prediction of the actual sequence versus a, a reference sequence. So that's quite nice because now you can decompose, you can kind of interpret the contributions of important scores of every nucleotide in the sequence. And so just to give you some examples of what this looks like, this is, uh, this is the OCT4 gene. This is a distal enhancer that regulates OCT4, very well annotated. It is bound by all these four transcription factors, as you can see here, beautiful footprints predicted by the model. And if you look at the deep lift scores of the, um, um, the same sequence with respect to each of these tasks, remember we have four tasks, so we can interpret the same sequence using four different outputs and we get different scores. You get these really clean base resolution scores. Yours one, you know, looks like a motif that's firing. Uh, you can see for Nanog, this motif is firing specifically for Nanog. And then for KLF4, these motifs are firing specifically. And so these actually look like transcription factor binding sites. So if you take known motifs and you map them, you can actually get a sense for which motifs are actually activating uh, or combinatorially interacting potentially uh, to generate each of these or to predict each of these different binding profiles. So we can take any single enhancer and really dissect at base resolution, uh, you know, which piece of the sequence, which nucleotides are driving binding. This is quite nice. So we can use this for every enhancer in the genome, but we'd also like to learn consolidated motif models potentially that are learned by the network, right? Um, the one approach is to take a known library of motifs if they're very good and scan the sequence uh, and look for these important, uh, high importance hits. But we also want to try to learn other networks learning more interesting motifs. That's something we want to figure out. So Avanti, what she did is she has another algorithm called TF Modisco, where she can take all the enhancers in the genome or all the binding sites, all the peaks, and she can apply deep lift to them. And so that will highlight all the important bases in the sequence for each of these sequences. We can throw away the nucleotides that are actually not important as predicted by the model and restrict ourselves to these short, what we call cichlids. These are short subsequences with high importance. And then she has a very clever clustering algorithm uh, based on uh, like low end community detection with a novel uh, distance function to account for these continuous, we're not, so one you know, important thing to note is we are not simply clustering sequences. These are sequences with weights on each nucleotide, right? So we, she developed a beautiful new distance metric called a continuous jacquard distance between these sequels, uh, which and then applies low end community detection to that with many other interesting tricks to consolidate these sequels into uh, beautiful motifs. And these look like position weight matrices, but they are not. And this will be important as we go forward. We call these contribution weight matrices because they're not averaging the frequency of the nucleotides, which is what typically um, position frequency matrices or position weight matrices do. Here, what we're seeing is the average contribution score of each nucleotide in aligned sequels, okay, across all the aligned sequels. So it does look like a PWM, but the interpretation of each letter is different. The height of the letter is not the information content based on the frequency on the normalized frequency of the nucleotides, it is actually the average predictive contribution of each base. So what do we learn? Well, the first thing we learn is to predict four transcription factors, even though the neural network has several hundreds and thousands of millions of parameters, you can collapse that into a much smaller set, but that set is also not four. So the four transcription factors are not bound to just four motifs. Uh, we actually find 50 different motifs, and each of these are quite distinct. Uh, they look kind of similar, but I'll get to these nuances about why they are actually different and do they represent biology or not. So I'm going to show, just going to show you a few. Uh, these are the main ones that we will focus on today. Uh, as you can see, you pick up you know, the ox, famous oxox heterodimer. This is the CWM, and this is the corresponding PFM, position frequency matrix derived from the model. Okay. This is the OCT4 monomer. This is the OCT-OCT homodimer. This is the SOX2 monomer. We learn three different nanog motifs. I'll talk, talk about this quite a bit. Uh, there's KLF4, there's KLF4 long, there's B-box. How did that appear? Uh, 
ZIC3 and ESRRB. There are also binding, as you can see, motifs of transcription factors that we didn't even profile. And I'll get to that in a second as well. And each of these motifs actually have combinatorial contributions to binding of all four transcription factors. So for example, you can see the OX-SOX motif is very important for not only OX4 binding, SOX2 binding, but also NANOC binding. Uh, and so you can see this kind of nice um, uh, TF specific contributions of the same motifs, right? You also see that uh, the footprints very strongly support each of these motifs based on their instances. You can again see OX the OXOX motif has beautiful footprints for OX4, SOX2, and NANOG. Uh, and you'll see that the direct binding events, so we know, for example, OX4 and SOX2 directly bind the OXOX motif. You'll see very sharp footprints. Here's NANOG's direct binding site. You can again see really sharp footprints. Here, if NANOG is being recruited by the SOX2 motif, correspond tethered binding, you see fuzzy footprints. So we can actually distinguish direct binding from, from indirect binding very effectively by looking at the shapes of the footprints and the fuzziness or the sharpness. And we have some nice ways of analyzing that in the paper. So now we can also take all these motifs and look at the number of instances, predictive instances in the genome. And we can actually find that, you know, we find 20, over 50,000 predictive instances of KLF4 and so forth. These are much cleaner versions of the motifs than just sequence scanning, because these are not just matches to the motif, but these are also predictive matches supported by footprints, right? So we get high resolution uh, predictions of directly bound or indirectly bound uh, motifs that are actually driving uh, profiles. And we can take any single binding event, like a chip seek peak, sorry, a chip exo peak, a thousand base pairs and dissect, how many motifs do we see in those thousand base pairs? And so we usually see quite a few on uh, the, the mode is about three or four, uh, median is about four. And in some cases you have up to eight motifs inside a single binding site, all collaborating to bind a single transcription factor, which is really cool. <clears throat> so uh, just to give you some evidence of indirect tethered binding, um, there are obviously direct binding um, uh, motifs, known motifs. But we also see very interesting tethering. So for example, ZIC3, which we never profiled, its motif shows up as being very important for NANOG and KLF4. And we actually did a chip exo experiment for ZIC3, chip nexus, and we do in fact see very sharp footprints precisely at these locations. So you can again contrast the sharp footprint of direct binding of ZIC3 against the fuzzy footprint of NANOG and KLF4. We also see that this TF3 B box, and this was a very interesting story. Uh, we actually found uh, this motif popping up specifically for OCT4, as you can see. And these are all localized at tRNA genes. And what's really interesting is the B box actually sits, so if you take all the tRNA genes and you look at their start and end positions, right, TSS and TTS, you can see OCT4 binds really strongly on the start and the end and shows a tethered footprint at the B box. So what we believe is happening is there's some kind of looping event where OCT4 is binding the start and the end of the tRNA gene. And you've got TF3C, which transcribes the tRNA, and OCT4 interacts with it and creates an indirect footprint at the B box. That's our hypothesis. We've not proved it, but it's, it's very interesting, indicating an important role of OCT4 in potentially regulating these tRNA genes in embryonic stem cells. Uh, we can also find multiple different versions of the nanog motif. So, um, you know, we not only find the classical nanog motif, this very strong TCA motif or ATCA motif, that's the primary footprint, as you can see right here. But if we find two other versions of the nanog motif, and you might say, hmm, are these real or are these just kind of random things that your model's finding? Luckily, we have a crystal structure of nanog binding DNA as a monomer. And in fact, the contact region in the crystal structure is exactly AATGGC. So it's actually this piece right here. And that produces a different footprint than the main footprint. And then you find a third footprint, uh, which is contributed by this GGAATC, which uh, potentially is coming from, potentially we think from another partner, very likely. Um, so we're actually picking up very di interesting, distinct footprints of the nano transcription factor. So that's great. We we be able to learn interesting motifs and more complexity of motifs and subtle differences in motifs uh, driving 
these binding events, right? Now you want to figure out syntax, not just motifs. You want to actually now start figuring out all these syntactic roles. So how do we do that? So we asked first the question about, uh, you know, there's been hypotheses about whether these motifs in the, in the, in the I mean, enhancers, whether they have strict spacing constraints, right? Does one motif like to be an extra motif with some fixed spacing? So we tried to find uh, instances of pairs of motifs that showed very strong spacing constraints. So the x-axis is just the, um, uh, the distance between the motifs and the, um, the frequency on the y-axis of how often you see them exactly at those distances. And uh, what you're seeing spiking right here, uh, the motif pairs that show very strong spacing constraints. And what we see is some of them are classic composite motifs like nanog, nanog, you know, homodimers. You also see ox, ox, nanog, the triplet. Uh, these are very short spacings, which makes sense. They are like probably direct protein-protein interactions binding DNA. But then we find a bunch of these which are very far apart, like 46 base pairs apart, 68 base pairs apart, 62. Really fixed spacing constraints. If we figure out where in the genome these fall, they actually are all sitting in retrotransposons, repeat elements, right? And so what we are seeing is there's very little evidence of actually fixed spacing constraints as a cis-regulated rule of syntax. Most of it is variable spacing. And the fixed spacing is really coming from background of retrotransposon elements that actually contain these motifs. And we can take these individual retrotransposons and we can beautifully dissect the precise positions of these motifs within these repeats, okay? So analyzing these retro elements is often quite difficult because they're very repetitive. Um, and if you try to learn motifs directly from the data, you just learn the whole retro transposon because the entire sequence is replicated many times. And so you learn these gigantic motifs, you know, 46 base pair, 50 base pairs. But if you look at the important scores, so if you construct this contribution weight matrix, you can actually pick out the precise bases that are bound by the TF, supported by the footprints. So we've used this quite nicely to dissect retrotransposons and figure out interesting evolutionary properties of these sequences. <clears throat> now, what we also find is other very interesting subtle properties. <clears throat> so if you take the narrow motif and look at its flanking region and look at the position frequency matrix, we see nothing. But if you look at the contribution weight matrix, which is slightly different, as I mentioned. It's not capturing frequency of nucleotides, but the contribution scores. We actually see these really beautiful periodic, you know, spikes of importance. These TAAT spikes, and you can actually visualize that here. So here, each uh, row corresponds to a different nanog binding site. We've centered on this TCA motif, and we're just plotting uh, in a heat map the contribution scores, and you can see exponentially decaying contribution scores, kind of rising and falling with a precise 10 and a half base pair frequency. And the 10 and a half base pair frequency, as you know, is the helical periodicity of DNA, right? And so uh, what we're seeing- question from the audience, if I may yes. interrupt you, yes. about the point you made earlier. Um, the question is, hi, how robust are the weights of a trained network across different runs? Do you get the same interpretations if you run deep lift uh, on retrained models? Excellent question. In the paper, we actually did 10-fold cross-validation. So we actually effective, explicitly tested reproducibility of all of these results. And we see very good, very good concordance uh, across the 10 folds. So if you just fit 10 different models to the data, uh, the deep lift uh, as well as the, uh, the MODISCO results are extremely stable. But we have another paper out uh, on BioArchive uh, where we devised a new method to further stabilize these models. We call those attribution priors. Uh, you can take a look. We use like a basically like a, a Fourier transform based um, uh, constraint on the loss function to minimize uh, high frequency components in these deep lift scores uh, during training. It's a, it's a soft regularizer. And that we show actually even further dramatically improves reproducibility. So you can get extremely accurate and reproducible results, uh, even more than just this model, which did not use it, uh, if you use the attribution priors. Uh, what we see here is actually the, the, because we have these base resolution footprints, they really help localize signal. And that's one of the nice advantages is that uh, if you just have a scalar over the whole sequence, it's often difficult to, the model can make the same prediction using many different tricks, 
right? So if you fit 10 different models, you can often get very unstable results. Uh, when you fit base resolution uh, profiles, there's more constraint in the output. And so that really helps regularize, naturally regularize the model. And then on top of that, if you add our attribution prior, which we have, uh, which is very simple, it's just a little trick to add, the, add to the loss functions, very efficient. Uh, you get incredible boost in stability, even more. Uh, they almost like the, the replicates, sorry, the cross validation fours almost look identical, which is shocking because usually the models are quite unstable. Okay. Thank you. Great question though. Uh, stability is a very important um, issue in deep learning and interpretation in particular. And uh, luckily, I think over the, over the years, we've learned how to stabilize the models. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so th this 10 and a half base pair periodicity is very likely coming from the fact that Nanog, in fact, like many other homeobox uh, proteins, likes to bind nucleosomal DNA uh, as homodimers in this precise 10 and a half base pair um, configuration. And this has been observed previously even in vitro with NCAP CLEX data, which is in vitro binding to nucleosomal DNA. Okay. And what's really interesting is this 10 and a half base pair periodicity is seen for all the motifs that drive Nanog. Those same motifs also drive other factors, but when you look at the importance with respect to other factors, you don't see that 10 and a half base pair periodicity. So this helical periodicity is a very specific property of Nanog and all the motifs that are driving Nanog binding directly or indirectly. We can also look for these soft spacing constraints between Nanog, Nanog homodimers. Uh, so if you look for two motifs for Nanog, what, do we see any preferred spacing? And we see really for, for various configurations, so whether they are on the same strand or on the opposite strand, we again see that the contribution scores show beautiful 10 and a half base pair periodicities. So this is actually, you know, you can really, this, this sort of in some sense supports the hypothesis that nanog is binding as a homodimer where you have instances of the motif uh, with soft helical spacing preferences. These are not hard preferences. Uh, it prefers multiples of 10 and a half where it strengthens binding. It's actually very hard to find this periodicity with regular motif scanning. So if you just scan the genome for these uh, using PWMs without using the contribution scores, it's actually quite hard to find that periodicity. And the reason is because the motifs are really short and you get lots of kind of false positive hits. It's very kind of difficult to figure out the bound you know, motifs versus kind of random hits. And once you actually train the model, and you get the contribution scores, you can really dissect this at fine resolution. Um, you also see this periodicity again between Nanog and other transcription factors. So Nanog and SOX2, Nanog and OXOX. And that's the reason we were seeing the 10 and a half base per period periodicity, periodicity, the Fourier uh, spectrum uh, for the other TFs as well. And just to show you that this is not an artifact that the model is making up based on some parameters of the convolution neural network. Um, if you actually take these motif instances and you line them up and you look at the reads, the raw reads from the data, you actually see this beautiful spiking, right? So what the model is doing is homing in on these spikes of reads. These are very subtle. You only see them once you align them really nicely. Uh, and it's able to pick up this very subtle structure in the reads. Again, highlighting the importance of trying to model the data at base resolution. If I just sort of model this at thousand base pairs, without taking into account the shapes of the profiles, I would miss all this beautiful structure, right? Which allows the model to learn this very subtle syntax. So that's quite nice, but this doesn't tell us how the motifs interact potentially to give rise to binding, right? Do we see actually cooperative effects? Do we see nonlinear interactions? Does motif of one factor affect binding of the other? So we developed kind of a powerful in silico framework for testing this. One of uh, strategies to use um, synthetic sequences. So we can just create synthetic sequences, embed motifs in them, uh, move these motifs towards and away from each other and use the model as an oracle to predict what happens to binding. The other is we can take the genome and actually mutate motifs and predict what the model would, would predict would happen to binding. So I'll show you examples of both of these in the next two minutes. Uh, so this is an example of one of these simulations on synthetic DNA. We insert uh, the Nanog motif right here and the OxOx motif and we move it towards each other. And what you're seeing is in real time, the model is predicting what the profiles will look like as these motifs move towards or away from each other. 
And what we see is something very beautiful. So I'm plotting two uh, curves here. The yellow curve is the response of Nanog. So it's the change in the footprint height at this position as ox ox moves, moves towards each other, uh, towards it. And the red curve is the change in ox force binding as the motifs move towards each other. And you see something very striking. First of all, you see this beautiful, very strong effect of ox for ox ox on Nanog, right? But the reverse is not true. So Nanog almost has no influence on ox on ox for binding. Also, the influence of ox ox on Nanog it decays up to 150 base pairs. That's exactly like a nucleosome range. And it oscillates with a 10 and a half base pair frequency. So again, you see the cooperativity, the effect of the oxox motif and anode binding. Uh, its effect ranges all the way up to nucleosome range with helical periodicity, the stabilization in every 10 and a half base pairs. Um, and so we do the same thing for the genome itself. We can take actual enhancers and, for example, delete the oxox motif, and you can see. Uh, binding of both transcription factors disappears. But if we, if we delete the nanog motif, you can see the ox ox pattern. So the ox4 pattern stays as it is, uh, but the nanog pattern gets destroyed. And so we can again average this across all the uh, enhancers in the genome, and we again see the beautiful um, asymmetric um, interaction effect uh, between ox ox and nanog with a 10 and a half base pair periodicity. And so we see all kinds of these kinds of beautiful asymmetric directional effects of one motif on the other, one TF on the other. And we see this, um, uh, some of these are short range protein-protein interactions, others are nucleosome mediated uh, interactions all the way up to 150 base pairs. And so uh, just to validate this, Julia actually performed beautiful CRISPR uh, ex experiments where at single loci, she, for example, uh, we took, us, uh, here's a predicted profile for SOX2, here's a SOX2 motif, uh, here's the observed uh, profile, so they look very similar. We can then mutate this motif. We can mutate these two base pairs and then predict what would happen. And you can see that SOX2's binding disappears and it also gets attenuated up to, you know, uh, about 50 base pairs away. Uh, the observed data after the mutation, CRISPR mutation, looks very similar, validating sort of the, the medium range SOX2, SOX2 cooperative effects. Uh, we also see Nanog. So this is the same uh, experiment, but you're now measuring Nanog binding. Again, Nanog gets destroyed at this position uh, when you delete this, when you mutate the SOX2 motif, very similar to what you see in the actual observed data. And we can do the reverse and show that if you delete the Nanog motif or you mutate the Nanog motif, it has uh, you know, short range effects on Nanog binding. But if you delete the Nanog motif or you mutate it, it has no effect on SOX2. So we have some nice experiments, CRISPR experiments validating this, uh, this relationship. I'll skip this, but we have other nice uh, validation against attack seek experiments after TF depletion. Uh, the model actually predicts um, differential chromatin accessibility very nicely. Um, again, hinting at why cooperative binding is very important for chromatin accessibility. And it also generalizes to massively parallel reporter experiments of um, in, in these same mouse ER cells, okay? So just to conclude, uh, I presented BPNet, which is a general architecture to map DNA sequences to base resolution profiles. Uh, you can apply this to ChIP-seq, ChIP-exo. In fact, in the paper, we also have ChIP-seq. We've now applied to cut and run. We've applied to DNAs, to attack-seq, to single cell attack-seq, pro-seq. Works really beautifully. Um, we are expanding this to long range histone ChIP-seq data. You can take these models and then use a suite of interaction, uh, sorry, interpretation methods uh, to reveal motifs, syntax, cooperativity. And lastly, uh, I showed you some examples of experimental validation at base resolution, really showing that um, the models predictions are really quite accurate uh, with respect to binding, differential chromatin accessibility, reporter expression. And right now we're working on expanding these methods or testing them for variant effect prediction. So again, thanks to all my collaborators and students who did all this work and the funders. Thank you very much for a very exciting talk. So now it's time for questions. Let's start in the network. Damian Rokairo has a question. Damian, please. Thank you, Christian. Thank you very much for, for the talk. It's very exciting to see 
the, the models and the predictability and also interpretability. I, I, I have a question, you touched upon it at, at the very beginning, and I don't want to go very technical, but uh, when you discuss the idea of also considering the bias, I'm yes. thinking of, of this chip seek experiment where actually the peaks are the result of a controlled DNA that, that you have. So, so I, may, I may think that that's a source of bias, and I was yes. wondering how, how do you model that? Yeah, so the precise way we do it is we add the control track as an as a additional input, right, to the model, but we only add it to the last layer, right before the output. So it's almost effectively like, imagine you have, it's almost like you have two inputs, right? You have the sequence and the bias, and they're competing to explain the observed profile. And the model has to figure out which it prefers to use, right? You can also fit this in two steps. You can first just ignore the sequence, fit a bias model, a very simple linear bias model, right? That just takes a bias and tries to predict the profile. Then you freeze those parameters and then you add the sequence. So the sequence has to fit the residual, right? And so the nice thing about this is we don't have to pre-correct the sequence, uh, sorry, the profiles. We just add the bias and the neural network can learn even more complex transformations of the bias to explain uh, the profile you see, and then use the sequence to only explain what you cannot explain with the bias. I see. That's the idea. And so you can use all kinds of bias tracks. So when we do DNAs, for example, we just take a DNAs bias track and we add it as an auxiliary input. And that explains, that digresses out all the enzyme bias and then the sequence fits to the residue. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. The second most popular question on Slido is the following. Thanks for the talk. Why a multinomial distribution when predicting binding sites from ExoSeq data? I'm sorry, I didn't get that part. That's the question. Sure, no problem. Um, so if you think about uh, basically, you know, we are modeling the counts in its native, you know, state. We are not normalizing. We're not doing anything because you know we have counts, and what is the best way to model counts? So uh, if you had counts over the thousand base pairs, you can imagine using a Poisson distribution, a negative binomial distribution, which captures the nature of the noise quite nicely, right? In fact, we did try that. But if you think about how counts are distributed across thousand base pairs, it's like having you know thousand bins, and you have a bunch of balls, and you're throwing them into these thousand bins, right? That's precisely what the reads are actually doing. There's some binding occupancy in the thousand base pairs. And then depending on precisely where the TFs bind, they determine how those reads, N reads, are distributed across a thousand base pairs, those thousand bins. And the distribution that captures the nature of noise of that kind of event, the best is a multinomial, right? You can think of other ones too, but multinomial is a very natural fit to it. And it, you can see how multinomial can also correct for dropout events because you might observe zero reads at a position, but that might just be because the total number of reads that you're distributing is very low. That base can still have a finite probability, not a zero probability of observing some reads, right? And since the multinomial fits the probability, you can actually impute uh, expected values even when the data is very sparse. And that's how we actually see examples where you know, you see very sparse uh, reads, you know, across the sequence. But then if you look at the predicted profile, it's beautiful and continuous, right? You actually see values at every position. And that allows us to actually impute footprints at individual loci uh, with very high confidence, even though the observed footprints are very noisy at individual locations. And the multinomial works even better for chip seek, which is even noisier. Right, so the more more noisy the data gets, uh, the, you want to you know use a loss function that is actually uh, quite good at dealing with that kind of noise. So as you know, even for single cell data, people use multinomial distributions nowadays quite a bit to model uh, counts. Uh, that's that's part of the idea. Thank you. There's another question from inside the network, Suki. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Please hi. go ahead. Uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. And my, my, my question is on the, uh, the choice of convolutional neural network. Yes. So what do you think is the advantage of it over uh, recurrent neural network in your scenario? Because I think the recurrent neural network is more uh, specific to sequential data. That's a very good question. So um, yeah, this is a common question. And I think uh, it is often, um, so the way to think about it is convolutional neural networks are also perfectly fine for sequential data. The, uh, the question is how much structure do you actually observe in the sequential data, right? Uh, if you're modeling protein sequences, 
uh, I don't think you will have much hope with the CNN. Uh, you would want something like a recurrent model or a transformer or something like that because the exact order of each nucleotide um, really matters, right? In in protein coding sequences, um, in in regulatory DNA, as you know, motifs uh, have a fuzzy syntax. Uh, you don't exactly care where they exactly are. They can move around, and it's more like a translationally invariant convolution model. It's basically like looking at a one-dimensional image, and you know, and scanning it, right? So it's basically a scanning operation, looking for motifs, yeah, and yeah. there are mostly relative constraints between motifs. So the convolution architecture fits that very well. We've tried recurrent architectures. We've not seen any uh, gains. Uh, and as you know, um, interpreting recurrent architecture is actually much harder. So we have all these beautiful tools for interpreting CNNs and uh, we, we basically be able to push them as far as we can take them. And we are basically at replicate accuracy. So we don't see much of a advantage of potentially switching to recurrent architectures. There will be situations where it might help so we're actually, for example, if you're, mo if you're modeling very long range interactions right in the genome, right now we're looking at thousand base pair chunks and modeling local sequence. As you start expanding, you might want to try more complex um, models that can capture, you know, very specific memory events of, oh, there was an event here and then, you know, 5,000 base pairs later, there's another event that interacts with it. Those kinds of much more structured sequential effects, um, things like transformers and stuff might be interesting. Uh, but at least for these local models, um, we don't see any advantages of recurrent architectures. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we, run, we are running out of time. Therefore, I have to close the, the question session here. Um, but I thank you very much, Anshul, for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, we learned a lot about uh, the power of deep learning on sequences. Thanks for, for joining our summer school and, and also f again for getting up so early to do so. Thanks no a lot. Thanks, it was Thanks a pleasure. Everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.